Master Sun says that the ultimate skill in taking up strategic position is to have no form. But what does no form mean? Hi, I'm John LeMay and welcome to my basement war room. This video is one in a series entitled The Great Military Philosophers on Afghanistan. Today, I'm diving into The Art of War, Chapter 5, Strategic Advantage, and Chapter 6, Weak and Strong Points. After covering those two chapters, I'll talk a little bit about an example from Afghanistan and then conclude with some references. So, let's jump right into it. Strategic Advantage. The main theme uh, from this chapter is strategic advantage and how do you gain it. Master Sun said, for gaining strategic advantage in battle, there are no more than surprise and straightforward operations. Yet in combination, they produce inexhaustible possibilities. So, Giles translates uh, surprise and straightforward operations as indirect and direct operations, and Griffith translates it as extraordinary and ordinary operations. What I really think Master Sun's talking about here uh, can be demonstrated with the example of a flanking maneuver. And so here is an enemy force and a friendly force squaring off in a straightforward operation. They're fighting each other and the friendly force detaches a smaller element that comes around to the flank of the enemy in a surprise operation. And so flanking is an example of straightforward and surprise operations from Master Sun. Now he says there's uh, inexhaustible possibilities with these two s concepts. So certainly there can be a lot more than just flanking. But I do think it highlights what he's talking about here. Okay, the expert in battle seeks his victory from strategic advantage and does not demand it from his men. This sort of hits home because I believe in our current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we did a lot of demanding victory from subordinate elements. And the concept of operation or conop brief really personifies this trend. So before our current wars, US Army doctrine and procedure was to do uh, the military decision-making process at higher headquarters and then issue an order to subordinate headquarters. And subordinate headquarters would then receive the order, and that is actually the first step of, of uh, the military decision-making process to receive higher headquarters order. And they would then do MDMP on that and then issue it down to the next headquarters. And as these, from sort of highest to lowest headquarters, did the military decision-making process, they were securing uh, their advantage for their subordinates by synchronizing the war fighting functions, by doing good planning, um, by coordinating you know, positions on the battlefield, so that they were getting strategic advantage as best they could for the subordinates. In Iraq and Afghanistan, what we did is higher headquarters said, hey, this is an insurgency. We don't understand company commander, platoon leader, what's going on in your area of operations, so you tell us what you're gonna do. And and not only are you tell us what you're going to do, ask for approval to do it before you do it. And so subordinate units would make their plans. They'd develop what's called a concept of operations brief, and they would send it up to higher headquarters. Then at higher headquarters, many field grade officers would pour over it and critique it and uh, find reasons to disapprove it and really slow down uh, the initiative of what subordinate elements were trying to do. And so... I think we did a lot of demanding victory from our men as opposed to gaining the strategic advantage for them in our current wars. Okay, so I talked a little bit about strategic advantage. Now let's take a look at weak and strong points. Okay, so when Master Sun writes about weak and strong points, the first thing that comes to mind is from US Army doctrine, key terrain, decisive terrain. That's not really what he's writing about. What Master Sun is writing about is the correlation of forces. He's writing about how to mass your forces against a smaller, less, lesser amount of the enemy. And he goes into how you can achieve this in chapter six. So Master Sun writes, if he cannot anticipate 
Thus, the positions the enemy must prepare to defend will be many, from the Ames translation. To be prepared everywhere is to be weak everywhere. On the path to victory, avoid the enemy's strong points and strike where he is weak. The ultimate skill in taking up strategic position is to have no form. And that really comes to the crux of it, that last statement. Because what Master Sun prescribes is, don't let the enemy know where you are. Therefore, the enemy has to disperse himself in order to protect everything he has to protect. If the enemy doesn't know where you are, then you can attack at a time and place of your choosing with a superior quantity of forces, so you can pit your strength against the enemy's weakness. This makes me think of interior lines. Uh, interior lines are very important in civil war, in Napoleonic warfare, and, and still today. And the idea of interior lines is that two units are positioned so they can easily reinforce each other. They're on interior lines, and so they can quickly move to each other. Against enemies that are on exterior lines, where they have to traverse a greater distance to reinforce each other, that lets units that are on interior lines mass together quickly, achieve that local superiority, uh, that advantage in numbers against the enemy, and defeat it before another enemy unit on exterior lines that has to go further to reinforce, can get there to reinforce them. So, weak and strong points. Okay, I talked a little bit about that. Let me try and illustrate it with an example from Afghanistan. Okay, this Afghanistan example is not any specific terrain from, a, from Afghanistan. This is not a, a real place. I just made up this hypothetical terrain, but it is based on my real world experience in Afghanistan. So let me first orient you to the map. So here on the map, to the west, we have farmland. And actually, if, if you've ever seen a Vietnam War movie and like rice paddies in, in uh, those war movies, uh, Afghanistan, many Afghanistan farms look very much like Vietnam uh, rice paddies. So here we have some to the west, farmland, to the south, mountains, to the east, mountains, and coming all, all up a little bit to the north. Splitting the map, we have a north-south running river, and then parallel to it, a uh, road, and then of course this road coming out uh, into the farmland, and then we have two villages up in mountain passes with little roads going to them, and then a village out here in the farmland doing the farming. A combat outpost is securing this intersection of the roads next to this bridge that crosses the river, and that's the map. Now let's take a look at the opposing forces. For the friendly, we have first the U.S. A military police platoon, two U.S. infantry platoons, an Afghan National Army company, and two Afghan uh, police units. So that's probably about 350, 400 soldiers. And then opposing them are two Taliban squads. Not exactly how they'd be organized, but, but really two groups of, two say cells of around seven uh, Taliban each. Now these opposing forces don't include command and control, sustainment logistics. Uh, there's a lot more back, bone between both groups than shown here, but these are the fighting forces. Okay, so the U.S. was always going to have at least one platoon of combat power securing that combat outpost. The Afghan police are going to be up in these villages in the mountains, so we've got some police in the village in the mountains. The military police platoon is going to be partnered with those uh, police units, so it's going to be spending most of its time up in the villages. This Afghan army company is going to be securing this larger farming community. This uh, remaining infantry platoon is going to be partnered with this Afghan army company, uh, training and mentoring it. And so, yeah, the Taliban take a look at this and like, hey, we can't, we can't attack a company partner with a platoon or, or you know, the military police platoon. That, that's too much strength. We'd be pitting our weakness against their strength. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna place some IEDs where they're really annoying. We'll put some IEDs out on this bridge. We'll put some IEDs on this road, this line of communication where the supplies come in for the combat outpost. So we'll do that. I'll say, okay, so we can place these IEDs 
and uh, cause a lot of uh, problems for the local people by putting stuff on bridges and for the, of course, the military. So hey, now this MP unit is going to spend more time patrolling these bridges and the uh, army is going to spend some more time out here securing this road. Okay, so now we have the police in the village uncovered uh, because the military police, the U.S. forces, are trying to control those two bridges. So the Taliban are going to mass their two little squads and attack the police. Uh, inflict some casualties there. After they do that, then the MPs are going to get more prioritized. Hey, get back, get back with your uh, with the police. And here, this army unit is going to have to uh, focus more on the roads and the bridges. And then the Taliban are just going to switch. And when the village is looking weak, because the army is back focused on the village and the river and the bridges, then they'll attack and harass the village. And so I could go on and on like this. But basically, the government is compelled, is required, uh, has to try and secure everything, has to defend everywhere and therefore it's weak everywhere because it can't be like, hey, we're going to write off a bridge, we're going to write off a road, we're going to write off a village. They've got to try and secure it all. And then the, this gives the insurgents the opportunity to pick where they're going to fight, try and draw out and achieve local superiority. And the insurgents are working very hard on remaining formless. And so we do not un know where they are, do not understand that until they, until they strike. One thing that does change this dynamic a little bit is air power. And so air power can get from place to place very quickly. And so when troops do get in contact, we're able to get uh, reinforcements that way very quickly. But although Sun Tzu wrote in the Chinese Warring State era and was writing about very large armies fighting each other when he wrote his principles. This idea of weak and strong points and strategic advantage absolutely applies to this. And I think we'll see a lot more of it when we study Mao because Mao is going to be drawing a lot on these principles from Sun Tzu on how you conduct guerrilla operations. Okay, so that's the Afghanistan example. Let me dive into a couple references. So the first, of course, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. This is the Giles translation. This is the Griffith translation. And then, not shown here, but my primary reference and the quotes you see on the board are from the Ames translation, which is on my Kindle. Hey, if this has been of value to you, please do join the Facebook group, Lessons of the Afghanistan and Iraq War. The notes from this are going to be posted there as a PDF. I can't post the PDF anywhere else on Facebook, but in this group, the social learning group, uh, I've got all the PDF notes from all these lectures posted there for you. So take advantage of that, check it out, and if you want to go a little deeper, please sign up for the newsletter at thebasementwarroom.com. Thank you very much for joining me today.